a soft midsummer night, we stood upon the roof of the United States Observatory. Above us, the fathomless heavens, the waning moon and silent stars. Professor Harkness moved an axle. The great revolving dome turned round and parted. The great telescope was pointed to the opening and the broad seam of sky visible between. There were the mountains in the moon, their jagged edges, their yawning craters. Those were the vivid memories of journalist writer Mary Clemmer Ames as she peered through a telescope on these grounds back in 1872. Just yards away, workers were building a dome to house the 26-inch telescope, soon to be the largest in the world. Many firsts in science took place in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. This is where the science of oceanography was born, where the moons of Mars were discovered, where the underwater path of the first transatlantic cable was plotted. This location played a key role in the Civil War, our westward expansion, and in the development of military medicine. Welcome to one of the most fascinating locations in our nation. In the 1820s, President John Quincy Adams recognized that powerful nations and science were synonymous. And the prestige science of that time was astronomy. The British had their National Observatory at Greenwich, the French had theirs in Paris, and before long, even the Tsar of Russia, the ruler of a, a poverty-stricken nation, would have his observatory at St. Petersburg. And so John Quincy Adams asked the Congress to appropriate funds to build a national observatory for the United States in Washington, D.C. An observatory which he called a lighthouse of the sky. But it didn't happen during Adams' presidency. Few legislators could see the practicality of having a core of elite scientists studying the craters of the moon, the rings of Saturn, or looking for undiscovered asteroids. Still, there was a practical reason for having an observatory. Because this was still the age of sail and celestial navigation, steering by the stars was essential. This meant certain instruments were required, a chronometer to determine longitude, and a sextant to measure an angle between the horizon and a celestial body such as the sun, moon, star, or planet. Once that angle was determined, you referred to a table in the nautical almanac, which revealed your latitude. Of course, in modern times, we have our global positioning system, our GPS, but in the old days, in the age of sail, you navigated by the stars. And in order to do that kind of navigation, you had to have a place where you could determine the positions of the stars in relation to the Earth. It was for this purpose that the Naval Observatory was finally built in 1844. The observatory's 9.6-inch refracting telescope once occupied this room. Mounted on a shelf above, were six solid-shot, 32-pound cannonballs acting as ball bearings. The dome actually rolled around on the cannonballs. Five trap doors or hatches raised by rope and pulley opened in sequence, providing access to the night sky for the 9.6-inch German refracting telescope made by Mertz and Mahler. A wind-up clock motor actuated by weights enable the telescope to track an object across the sky. By the close of the Civil War, the observatory entered its golden age. As an internationally recognized institution, the observatory dispatched its scientists to Europe, Siberia, and remote locations around the world to observe solar eclipses. To record the transit of Venus across the face of the sun in 1874, eight well-trained teams fanned out across the far Pacific. Never a top-of-the-line instrument, the 9.6-inch refractor was still the workhorse of the observatory. However, after 30 years of use, scientists were unable to observe many objects that were routinely being seen by astronomers who had larger instruments. 
So in 1871, Congress passed a bill that included $40,000 in gold for the acquisition of what was to be the world's largest telescope. The lens would be 26 inches in diameter and the tube almost 33 feet in length. To build the instrument, the Navy commissioned the finest opticians in the world, Alvin Clark and Sons of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Modern technology had indeed come to this side of the Atlantic. What had once been the dream of John Quincy Adams was now reality. The United States had not only achieved scientific independence, but now was technologically superior to Europe in many ways. Because of its size, the new telescope called the Great Equatorial would not fit on the third floor where the 9.6 inch refractor resided. A new rotunda had to be constructed. It was completed in 1873 and the new telescope affixed to a huge cast iron mount was then dedicated by President Ulysses S. Grant. Four years later, Mars and Earth were as close to one another as they had been for many years and the telescope was in the hands of one of the observatory's most skilled astronomers, Asaph Hall. Asaph Hall was on duty. It was a hot, humid August night in 1877. He was looking through the eyepiece of this gigantic telescope, the biggest in the world at the time. He had it pointed just a little bit east of south. He looked through the eyepiece and he saw what looked to him like a bright object, very, very close to the surface of Mars. Upon closer examination, he realized it was a satellite, it was a moon, and he named it Phobos. A few nights later, when the foggy bottom night cleared sufficiently, he discovered the second of the Martian moons, which he named Deimos. But with those two moons of Mars, the mass of Mars could be determined for the first time by Kepler's laws, and so that was the scientific significance. But it was important also for American astronomy because it really put the Naval Observatory on the map. Uh, these discoveries were announced around the world and uh, really made the Naval Observatory a first-class institution. There was no doubt that the U.S. Naval Observatory was now the finest observatory in the world. 